Hi, I'm Sheena Arete. Um, I'm from DePaul University, and just to tell you a little bit about myself, I, um, I'm a computer scientist by training. Um, I studied computer science, mathematics in undergrad, and I went to uh, at Spelman College in Atlanta, and I went to Georgia Tech for my master's in computer science and studied software engineering and HCI, uh, human computer interaction. Uh, but then I decided to uh, go to graduate school. I uh, went to Northwestern and I did a joint degree called Technology and Social Behavior where I studied computer science and communications. Um, it's, it's a really fancy name for saying that they were going to try to turn this computer scientist into a social scientist. So I'm kind of like a social scientist who does computer science. So I'm trying, I'm dabbling in both. Um, so that's kind of who I am. And so, um, in addition to obviously teaching at DePaul in the College of Computing and Digital Media, I also um, do research, right? Uh, and that's probably one of the most passionate things uh, about you know doing doing a PhD. Uh, and so, much of my work has focused more recently on this notion of thinking about assets, meaning how do we design technologies. Uh, not just build them, but how do we build them specifically for resource constrained communities and how do we do that in a way that leverages the assets that already exist in those communities. And so by assets I mean the human capital that's there, the social capital that's there, right? Um, the environment, the physical environment, etc. So how do we design um, technologies uh, and then I realized technologies can't solve the world. Uh, I realized that a long time ago, but then policies and practices, right? So how do we design all of those things around that? Uh, and so I'm going to talk, I'm going to present to you, I'm going to do something I've never done before, which I'm going to present to you three, I'm going to give you a brief overview, like 20 seconds each on each project, and then you tell me which ones, we're going to do a vote on which ones are most interesting to you that you want to hear about, and then I'll talk about those for like 10 minutes or 15 minutes, something like that. Okay, so let's go with it. So as you can see, like much of my work is, um, you know, community-based, so you may wonder, why do I study neighborhoods? I specifically study neighborhoods, and I mean geographically bound areas. And so, one of the reasons why, is it's really, it's really two reasons, right? Neighborhoods are this rich context for us to begin to think about um, how do people build networks, how do people talk uh, and commune in a, in a geographical space, but also neighborhoods play this really critical role in the social and economic, in our social and economic outcomes. So what does this mean? It means that where you live actually dictate a lot about you know, your final outcomes. Um, and so they impact things like health and economic status and mortality and safety, et cetera. So it's really important as we design technologies that we consider um, technologies that strengthen neighborhoods, right? Um, and particularly residents' collective um, responses to social issues that plague their neighborhoods. Um, so in my field in HCI, which is human computer interaction, lots of people have already studied um, technology and their use in local, uh, local settings. So they talked about things like collective information sharing and social capital. And even more recently, we've gotten more into looking at low SES and what does it mean to, to study technologies in uh, low SES or resource constrained environments. Um, and we've done work in, and there's been work done in like environmental sustainability and health and economic development and technology and what's the impact there. And so I said resource constrained. So to define it, I actually mean um, geographically bound areas that face disparities due to issues like concentrated poverty and low household incomes and that, um, that lack adequate health um, educational opportunities and basic health and human services and all of this due to uh, historical and economic historical policies that kind of have set this in place and so uh, you know research shows that technologies have this opportunity to worsen inequities right that's not what I was thinking would happen right when I was sitting in the lab as an undergraduate student right um, coding and so but we know this to be a fact right um, and so even work by uh, computer scientists at Northwestern, Brent Heck and his colleagues have found that even if you think about the uh, ride sharing and um, when you think about uh, sharing, sorry, when you think about ride sharing and those types of things, they actually have the ability to worsen uh, economic uh, inequities that already exist. So on that dim note, right, um, my work has really thought about this, right? So. 
since we already know that these inequities already exist, are there ways that we can leverage the, in, instead of taking a deficit approach, are there ways to kind of leverage the assets that are in those communities to make technologies that are sustainable, uh, that last, and that community, that have buy-in specifically from uh, resource-constrained communities? And so when I say deficit approach, like this is generally how we talk about communities who are resource constrained, right? We talk about them as what they don't have, unemployment and broken families and abuse and crime and et cetera. But what if we changed the narrative and talked a little bit more about this, right? Like the businesses that are there, the parks, the physical environment, the institutions that are there, right? And I would like to say I'm the genius that came up with this, but absolutely not. It came up 30 years ago in community, in urban planning, right? Um, when um, scholars have already thought about this notion of asset-based community development, right? John McKnight and the ABCD Foundation, uh, or ABCD Institute, he created the Institute at Northwestern 20, 30 years ago, right? And so, but as we design technology, what if we begin to take an asset-based approach, right? Instead of thinking about the deficits in resource-constrained communities as we build tools and technologies, but instead, what if we begin to think about the assets? So here's the projects. So I got three different projects. We'll do a show of hands. Emily is going to uh, uh, make sure that uh, count, like basically not count, but kind of do. Count everyone. You're gonna be. An, <laughs> you're gonna do an estimate for me. Okay. okay. So project one is really understanding the perceptions of smart and civic technologies in under in underserved communities or in marginalized communities, right? So what we did was we went into a community. We tr we actually did. Uh, kind of uh, tech forums, which are kind of like huge, huge, huge focus groups or design sessions where we talked about civic tech uh, and we learned lots of interesting things about their perceptions of civic technologies. So that's one, project one. Project two is designing technologies for violence uh, prevention, which we worked with Cure Violence, which used to be Ceasefire, which some of you may, he may have heard of, and we designed a mobile app which is leveraging uh, the violence interrupters themselves as uh, the community, um, as the assets within the community, and we tried to develop a tool uh, to see if that would actually help support them. And then the third one is, which I have less about, so that might be a five minute speech, um, which is uh, designing a socio-technical system solutions to address inequity in STEM, in STEM education. Um, and we went into a community uh, and we designed a three-year study where we had over 300 girls participate uh, who are in middle school who are um, underrepresented in computing. And we designed uh, technology as well as an environment for them to thrive. Okay, so with that being said, we'll do a show of hands, ready? I've never done this before, we'll see how this goes. One, all right, raise your hand if we're talking about, if you're interested in hearing about Project One. Some people were like, I hate her. If you don't, if you hate me, go get some brownies. Can you vote multiple times? No. No, don't vote multiple times. All right, project one, which is about perception of civic tech in underserved communities, okay. Project two, which is about violence interruption, the mobile app, violence interruption. You get a good feel. And then the third one is designing socio-technical solutions. What? The one that I have the least about. Yeah, I know, maybe it's because Oh, maybe because I, I don't have much about it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, da, 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 da. We'll, yeah, see. we'll see what ends yeah, up happening here. All right. All right, you guys ready? Okay. So if you're interested in the other two, I'll stick around and we can talk about it. Um, or you can read papers that academics write that nobody ever reads. All right. So. All right, so designing socio-technical systems. So this work is with Nicole Pinkard um, at Northwestern University. She created the Digital Youth Network, which is an amazing um, organization that has done this work for at, at least a decade. Um, and they actually created UMedia um, down at Harold Washington, which has re been replicated. So I have to give credit. And um, an amazing uh, people that we've employed and uh, that work with us at the Digital Youth Network. So I gotta give credit. Um, so, obviously, we all know this, right? There's a percentage of computer science degrees awarded to women um, are steadily uh, declining. Um, and a th about a third of CS has become, you know, uh, yeah, about a third as CS, um, oh, sorry, <coughs> declining from, uh, from high school, a third of CS has become 
um, to, the, the idea to major in CS has declined, right? Um, we also know that computer science students, high school students, if you look at AP exams, there's a uh, disparity in the number of males versus uh, women, right, uh, the, uh, that take the AP exam, right? Um, and this starts earlier than college, right? It doesn't start in college. It actually doesn't even start in high school. It starts in middle school, right? Um, you guys think back to when you're 11. Oh, God, that's horrible for me. Um, and 12, and those weird years, right, where you're developing your identity and who you are and who you hang around, all of that. So research has shown in education that around those identity-forming years is where people decide whether they're good or whether they're not good in CS, right? So we know that interest uh, starts with this initial situation, like whatever experience that you have. So if you go to uh, Shy Hack Night, you have a great experience, you're more likely to come back the next time, right? Whether you know what you're doing, whether, but if they make an environment where you feel really comfortable, you're more likely to come back. And the same thing for CS, right? So is there an opportunity for, for girls to participate? Um, so it's important to make sure that, you know, we have opportunities um, in computing, in CS, and in STEM where all students, you know, feel comfortable. And so, <clears throat> There are, this is nothing new, right? Um, there are lots of programs that are already out there, and including the program that you mentioned, right? Um, I'm gonna add that, add your logo to my slides for now, right? So there's nothing new about this, and many uh, are working to kind of provide these spaces where um, people of color and women um, are more, it was actually inclusive, right? So we, a lot of times we talk about diversity, but we don't talk about inclusivity, which is creating the environment where people can thrive. So um, if you think about a kid, right, they have a whole environment around them, right? So they have their adults, you know, we'll call them caring adults, whether they be parents or guardians or extended family, et cetera, right? We have mentors that could be there. We have institutions like the pu public library and U Media and all these other things that create spaces for people to kind of thrive in. Um, and then there's after school programs and their peers, which kind of create this other environment, right? And so our goal was to try to understand how do we create uh, so a socio-technical systems that leverage assets within, within this network, right, around a kid. So not just thinking just solely about the kid. I mean, not just thinking how do we develop the kid, but how do we develop a network where all of these things can help uh, influence uh, ch the child to, to kind of thrive. And so, there are five components to the program, and I say socio-technical systems because it wasn't just an online system. Yeah, we built something. I promise you it was super fun and it worked. It's connected to a database and all of that stuff, and we can talk about that, right? Yeah, we can talk about all that. But we also created a social environment, right? We had to think about how do you design not just the technology, but how do you design the social environment? And so we created project-based curriculum, um, you know, where they actually are doing projects as opposed to like large term projects that matter to them. Um, and then we obviously created the system, which is an online learning network. Um, we thought about the uh, caring adults. So we actually created a network where caring adults had workshops that they engaged in um, outside of the youth, right? Um, so what are those spaces like? So we created those spaces. Uh, and then also they have, it was an online system where the caring adults could actually talk to each other and talk about issues that they had, maybe encouraging their girls. Um, how do I encourage her when she says she hates math? And then another parent would respond and say, well, I do this typically, right? So those are the types of things uh, that we saw on the caring adult network. Oh, and then on the online social network, oh, this goes away. So on the online social network, I should also say that the girls could share their projects, the results of their projects. They actually posted them. They would respond. Why is this important? Because legally, you can't have 11-year-olds and 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds like kind of you know, sharing more broadly. And so that's what the, the network actually did. Uh, and then we, we embedded the projects into narratives. And so these narratives were culturally uh, responsive, right? And so they were culturally relevant, meaning, meaning that um, they leveraged characters within these stories, and I say stories, like literally stories, where we hire storytellers and um, artists, et cetera, to draw out and create narrative stories of very diverse characters that had different STEM um, abilities, right? 
So think of, well, I haven't seen The Incredibles too, so I don't want to say that. Um, but think about you know so, uh, stories where you have where almost they have superpowers, right? But it's quite realistic. So we created these narratives. And then the last thing is we had mentors. And so it was very important for us to hire mentors, not like myself. So Nicole and I, we did not create this program for ourselves, right? Because we were, I mean, I was a super nerd. I don't want to talk for her, but she was too. But, um, but you know, like, so I, I probably wouldn't have joined a program called the Digital Youth Divas because I was already, I always felt engaged in STEM, but we actually intentionally made, um, invited mentors who were at the college level, right? undergraduate level who um, did not have a STEM background, right? And that was on purpose, very much so, right? So it was almost like where they were learning together, right? So they were guiding the girls through this experience of STEM and, and recognizing that, you know, you don't have to be super person to do it, but we can all figure this out together, right? And so it kind of looked like this, right? So we did a lot of community building. Um, we embedded this in Bronzeville. Um, as well as we did it in DePaul, and now it's being rolled out to Evanston, all, this, all the schools in Evanston. Um, and we did observations and interviews to try to see if it works. Um, we did surveys, pre and post surveys, and knowledge assessments to see if the girls were learning anything, right, from this environment that we were creating. Uh, and then we did online ethnography. So recall, I said that we created an online network, you know. Um, we can talk about the details of that, but we also scraped all of that data to try to see what was happening, what were the girls learning, et cetera. Uh, and then we did quantitative and qualitative analysis. So the, inf the outcome of their environment was something like this. Now I want you to check out how focused these girls are, right? So, so this is the girls, they're kind of singing a song, some, some really popular song that came out two summers ago. Um, and they're really focused as they're singing this whole song, right? They're really, really focused on what they're doing. So this is kind of what the network, so you can imagine that this, this was happening in one classroom, and literally this was not like stage. We just walked in and was like, oh shoot, where's the camera? We should, where's the phone, right? We should take a video of this. And we had five classrooms like this, where these girls are really focused, singing, you can't get the full effect, singing, and like doing what they do, right? And so they're learning electrical engineering concepts and issue, things about circuitry and coding, et cetera, design. So this is kind of what the environment looked like. And then for those of you who are like, what about the data? So yes, I promise you, I can point you to all the papers that are posted on my website if you want to read specifically about um, the statistical data um, and to let you know that yes, there was a, uh, learning, uh, yes, we increased knowledge, right, and a STEM concept, so girls learned. Uh, we, there was also what we noticed when we looked at the ethnographic data, which was we had uh, uh, ethnographers sitting in the classroom, was that there were shifts in how girls talked about STEM, right? So initially they would talk about, like how they talked about different concepts, STEM concepts, circuitry concepts, and we saw a growth in how they actually talked about um, these STEM concepts. Uh, and then there was an interest increase in STEM, uh, an interest in STEM, and then their future outlook, right, and what they were going to do. And so this program, again, it was like a 20-week program, and they did it over a period of time, over two years, and then we kind of funneled them off into programs that are in the city um, as they get older. So that's kind of the program. So, um, so other challenges that we had was uh, translating the interest beyond divas, right? So really trying to figure out, so we created a program, the Digital Youth Divas, what happens when they go to high school? What happens when they go to college? And so some of the girls um, we've been following, uh, and some of them have translated that, have gone on, and some of them are, are really um, set on doing other careers, which we are totally fine with. We just want them to have the, we just want them to have the interests, right, and also um, the efficacy to say, I could do it if I want to do it and I understand it, right? But not that, oh, I'm scared, I'm, I can't do it, it's not for me, right? They said, oh yeah, I could do this if I want to, but I'm still gonna start my own business, but I'm gonna use the tech to, you know, to help me do whatever they want to do. And we're totally fine with that. So we still have to understand like the long-term outcome of that, so we're kind of tracking that. Um, and then, it's interesting because we're, we're trying to measure identity development over time, right? So um, there are lots of tears in this, in, in this, right? Just because like if you ever talk to a 12 year old, I have a niece who's 13 and it's amazing. I'm just like, I never want to go back to being 13 ever again. <laughs> um, 
but you can imagine that there's lots of identity stuff happening, development happening, and so we're trying to understand what's the identity shifts that are happening, right? So we have all of these very sophisticated measures that we use um, that have been used in education uh, and identity literature for a really long time. But those things don't really tease out like what are the shifts and changes of, of girls? How do they think about themselves in STEM? And what's their STEM identity? And so we're still kind of getting a whole, hole and handle of that. And that's especially the case given that m most of our girls were um, underrepresented anyway. So they're black and brown girls from lower income um, communities. Your job seems really cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to someone who is interested in the intersection of social science and technology? Would you get a computer science degree first or go the social science route first or something else? Ooh, that's a good question. Of course I'm going to say. That's more in the document too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I would. Man, okay, I have my own personal opinion, which is I think that the tech stuff, the earlier you just get into it and do it, the better, right? So you have that efficacy. Um, the better, the easier it is. That's kind of my approach to it. I think that if you don't have the tech, it's not like you can't learn it, right? Um, you can't learn it, but I think like, you know, knowing that I have the background to be able to build, build it if I wanted to build it, right, um, it's really important. Um, but I also think, that the, soci the social side is really important if you are already into the tech, right? Um, it's really nice to think that you're gonna build something. That's kind of why I wanted to talk about the other project, but it's cool, I'm not, I'm not upset. <laughs> I'm not upset, you know? But it's really interesting that like, because you guys are working with a lot of data and you're creating really cool apps, civic tech that can really have an impact, but also understanding that there are large parts of this city um, that feel like they can't use it, right? And try to get tease out like why and the historical, um, the issues and like how people feel, all of that stuff, like why, like what's the barrier to use it? So you can build the best thing ever, but if, you know, if it's just gonna worsen the inequities that are already existing, yeah, I'm just saying, okay. Um, thank you so much, it's really, really interesting. Um, you had mentioned that you had ethnographers in the classroom. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I was just really curious, like more broadly, what sort of qualitative methods you used, um, the importance of qualitative methods for um, kind of your findings and, and whatnot. Oh, he's like one of my favorite people right now. <laughs> All right, no, seriously, because, um, you know, we use a lot of quantitative methods, you know, uh, instruments and, and that sort. We use log data, we use a lot of log data, et cetera, but I think it doesn't answer the why question, it answers the what question, and we can only speculate. And so we take very, uh, we take, a lot of care to train uh, students um, to be ethnographers, essentially. And it doesn't matter your background, but to go in and just watch and observe. And so we have def lo definitely lots of observations, like hundreds of hours of observations, um, lots of field notes. Um, we actually do lots of interviews, focus groups, um, particip participatory design sessions, right? Lots of those. Um, yeah, what else? Um, we actually sometimes do long-term studies, like the Violence Interruption Project was over three months. So we go and do pre and post interviews as well as kind of like prompt people and try to get um, how they feel over a period of time, so diary studies. Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, that was fascinating. So um, I'm gonna start my question with a story. So I have a nine-year-old daughter. Um, she was the only girl in her Java programming camp this summer. She was the only girl in her robotics camp a couple summers ago. She was one of the only girl speakers at this kids' tech conference um, this winter. Um, I've become increasingly uncomfortable with siphoning girls out of those uh, regular, right, regular tech kids' classes. So I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on having, after doing this program just for girls, addressing the sort of detriment to then boys who don't see girls doing tech when they're also nine. Um, and sort of, how do we solve this problem of girls need more attention, but if we siphon them out, then that's causing perhaps even greater problems. Right, no, I, so I feel, we feel very strongly about that, that you have to develop. So, I mean, what, at least literature says is that if you become comfortable in any space and whatever, you can, you can thrive 
in any other space. And so I'll give you the example of like, I went to Spelman College. If anybody knows Spelman, it's an all women's college. Well, and so I never knew that there were not women or people of color because we stayed in the lab all night and we programmed and we built OS. You know, we did OS and we did theory and, we, and it never occurred to me until we went to our first programming competition, which was some, like it was thousands of people there and they were like, oh, Spelman was our, uh, just, just arrived. And I was like, oh my gosh, like there were thousands of people there and it, we were the only like all women's team. It was very strange to me. Um, but then I went to like, like I said, Georgia Tech, which is, you know, in the computer science, I mean, it's mostly men um, and definitely not many people of color, et cetera. But by that time I had already developed the efficacy to say I can do anything in whatever space. And I think that there are gonna be some women and girls who are, initially in that first experience, they don't actually need support or a community or anything like that, right? Um, and that's totally fine. That would have been me, probably, right? I probably didn't, I probably would have thrived anyway, right? Because I was a nerd. I told you that at the beginning of this, right? So I'm a nerd. Um, and so, but there are some women who could do this, but they don't feel comfortable. They don't have, they don't have efficacy already, right? They don't have that belief that they could thrive. Uh, and then, so we have spaces and environments that don't support that. And so our goal is to try to create those spaces in, in the environment specifically for girls who would not do it anyway, right? Who would not. So we're not targeting girls who would like automatically say, I want to do a job class. Because, you know, that's probably not the right. We're actually getting girls who say, I can't do it. And we're saying like, yes, you can. And now that you've done it here for X amount of time, now we kind of, the trajectory is for you to be in spaces where you don't have community. And that part is like kind of one of our challenges is to make sure that they join like the, those types of programs and as well as like, you know, programs at the Chicago Architecture Foundation and all of those. So like we have relationships with them to kind of push them off. Like you've been in this comfortable space, but now it's time for you to thrive. And by this point they have, you know, they have a ton of, you know, I can do it. Like I have no question that I can do it and nobody's going to tell me that I can't. So when I face adversity, I'm like, this is nothing new to me. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. I mean, that's right. I mean, this. Yes. Yeah. This is, this is a good approach. Right. This is. So that's our. And then yeah. Specifically for girls who don't believe that you do it anyway, right? And I think that, like I said, there are already going to be some folks who, you know, that they're already going to do it regardless. And I would encourage them to continue to do that, right? That's, that was probably me and Nicole. We would have never joined a group that's called Divas, right? We're like, what? That's crazy, right? When designing a new technology, what tangible advice would you give for better engaging communities that aren't traditionally engaged in the design process and designing for them too? Whew. You guys are like my favorite folks ever, <laughs> ever. Um, so I, I wholeheartedly believe in co-design um, and that's kind of taking that asset-based approach, right? And so working specifically with individuals and or institutions or associations that are in communities uh, and allowing them to co-design the tech with you. Um, and that kind of is risky, right? It's a little scary for us. It's scary for me as a computer scientist because I feel like I know, right? But if you want buy-in and if you want usage and you want sustainability, I feel like that's the best approach. And so um, what we normally do is we spend lots of time with the community we allow them to host. They are the hosts. We are the guests, and they're the experts, right? And so we're just going to build it. Um, we're going to build, hopefully, what we both believe. But um, we're going to we're going to co-design this thing together. And so we we use a human-centered design approach um, to to designing tech. Uh, and I would I would encourage people to kind of take that route. And also thinking about what are the associations that already exist. So that's the groups of people, residents who live in those communities. Um, what are their strengths? What are their concerns? Kind of, and, and building specifically around those types of things. Can you talk a little bit about the process of finding mentors and um, the type of activities that they're hosting, and then also their learning curve? Um, you said that it was as if um, the mentors were learning alongside the students. So. What did that look like? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and so the mentors that we hired for the, this program, um, we intentionally hired mentors who were not, um, like I said, computer science students or computing students already. Um, those mentors, as far as the learning curve, we had um, professional development sessions with them uh, weekly. 
We also provided an extreme amount of like uh, documentation. Um, and so our goal eventually for this program is for it to be, the reason why we did this is because again, the assets, if we wanna create something that's sustainable, like we can't actually be physically there. And this is a huge project and it was created, I mean it was funded by the National Science Foundation who gave us a significant amount of funds. But what happens after that? And we don't wanna just take that away from different communities. And so we created an, an amazing amount of documentation that the former mentors would create and say, Here's, the, here's how you run a classroom, right? Here are the concerns that girls who are 11 come in. It, was blo it blew my mind. I was like, oh, okay, we have to sit down in a circle and talk to them and let them air out whatever feelings they had that day, right, during our after school program. Um, so, and then they would say, you know, and this is the next step, right? And these are the next, so those are like the social, like creating that environment where these girls are like, yes, I feel safe and I feel like I belong here, right? Um, so that's, you know, those PD sessions are where also mentors, because imagine that classroom that you saw, we were running five of those classrooms. And so some mentors saw different things and they would talk about the challenges that they saw. Oh, how do I get, like there's one specific girl and she's not really engaged, how do I engage with her? And another mentor would say, oh, this is what I did, right? And so they would learn from each other. Um, and then as far as like the tech learning curve, I mean really these are projects and so um, it's surprising of how how hard we try to make STEM to be when it's really not, right? Um, and so we have an incredible amount of documentation that kind of like step by step. We also have instructional videos that the girls use. And so the mentors would actually use the same materials that the girls would use. And, and so far we haven't had, I mean we've had mentors like different age ranges all the way from like, you know, 18 all the way to, I don't want to call it anybody's age, but over 45, maybe 50. And so, uh, and they haven't had any issue with, uh, with the tech, the STEM part. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.